News of the Times, Wicked Wednesdays, Bloodthirsty Women. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we are doing something a little bit different. It is 1908, and England is shocked by the murders allegedly laid at the door of American Belle Gunness. From here, articles are written regarding which gender is more bloodthirsty, men or women? There was a prevailing notion that women were of a nobler breed with higher morals, making it more difficult for them to commit murder. This article questions this mythology and lays out a list of female murderers through time. From known Roman women killers to the most recent killings of Bell Gunness, Jean Weber, Jane Toppen, and Kate Bender. A historical review of women killing sprees from the standpoint of 1908, Are Women More Bloodthirsty Than Men? is today's episode of Wicked Wednesdays. We hope you enjoy the show. It is 1908, and the crimes laid at the door of American Belle Gunness stun England and extend to Australia. For those unfamiliar with Belle Gunness, she gained notoriety for her involvement in a series of murders, primarily targeting her suitors and husbands for financial gain. She is believed to have committed these crimes between the late 19th and the early 20th century. Her victims included husbands, children, and other individuals who came into her life, often through personal ads in newspapers. Belle Gunness owned a farm at La Porte in Indiana, where she lured her victims. She was known for her charismatic and charming demeanour, which helped her gain the trust of her victims. After acquiring their wealth through various means, she would allegedly murder them, bury their bodies on her property, and then collect life insurance or other financial benefits. The exact number of, of victims Bell Gunners claimed remains uncertain, as she was never caught or tried for her crimes. However, estimates suggest that she may have been responsible for the deaths of numerous people potentially surpassing 40 victims. Belle Gunness's crimes came to light in 1908, when her farmhouse burned down. In the ruins, authorities discovered the remains of several bodies, leading to an investigation into her activities. From this shocking crime and other crimes by females around this time, the question is asked if public perception needs to be changed regarding women. From the Ottawa Free Press, the 4th of July, 1908, are women more bloodthirsty than men? Some of the most atrocious crimes in history lie at their doors. Shocked and horrified beyond expression, the world recently read of the atrocious crimes of Mrs. Belle Gunness, disclosed after the burning of her house, where more than a score of bodies and skeletons were found on the isolated farm near La Porte in Indiana. In this little necropolis lie the ghastly records of almost inconceivable crimes of murders executed in cold blood because of lust for gain. The name of this murderous ogress of Indiana will go down in the annals of crime as one of the most notorious blood women of her time. With Locusta, Messalina, Lucretia Borgia, Catherine de Mici, and Brimvilliers, and other women who reveled in the taking of human life. Even more recently has the world shuddered as it read of the killing of seven or more little children by Jean Weber, a woman now shown throughout France as the ogress 
of the Goulet d'Or, who seemed to experience a strange intoxication of delight as she felt the bodies of babies writhe in death struggles beneath her strangling fingers. Reading of these two recent exposures of dreadful crimes of women, one recalls the murders of Jane Toppen, the nurse, who seven years ago confessed to 31 murders and also of the wholesale slaughter by the Bender family in the far west, 50 or more of whom which were said to have been inspired by handsome Kate Bender, called the evil genius of the family. History can give the names of few men who displayed such devilish deliberateness in the taking of individual human lives. One is constrained to ask the question, are women more bloodthirsty than men? And when the slender white hand of a woman is raised to strike, or drops a powder or poison in a glass, does she experience a strange, diabolic delight in crime not felt by men criminals? A curious pleasure in killing, a peculiar and keen interest in the symptoms of a poison, a sense of exquisite joy in seeing victims writhe in paroxysms of pain. This seems to have characterised the women who have committed such crimes in the past. The pitiless brutality of Mrs. Gunnus parallels that of the notorious Marquis de Brinvilliers, who poisoned her father, two brothers, and innumerable patients in hospitals upon whom she experimented in administering poison. Both women slew without a qualm of feeling, without a moment of hesitation, and with as much nonchalance as though this was giving wine to guests. Mrs. Gunnus used weapons, and her phlegmatic and solid nature felt no aversion at the sight of blood. More refined, the Marquis de Brilvilliers resorted to poison, the favourite means of murder amongst women. The almost inconceivable and unexplainable delight with which Jane Topham killed her 31 victims was paralleled in history only by the crimes of Valérie Massaline, both women revelling in a drunken ecstasy at the sight of writhing human bodies and human suffering, thrilling with strange pleasure at the sense of ebbing vitality in a human being, the former glorying in the contortions of death, and the more ancient monstrous, whom her husband put to death, exulting in mangled limbs and the flowing of crimson blood. Lucretia Borgia With Lucretia Borgia and her brother's murders, the killing was a means of revenge or advancement in power. Although the number of their crimes have not been def definitely fixed, it is said to exceed twenty. The Borgias were killers with poison. Poison so subtle and insidious that death came to the victim in the inhaling of flowers presented by the dazzling Lucretia or shaking the hand of Cesare. In these diabolical experiments, his historians declare the lovely daughters of Alexandra VI took a most keen and intense interest, and from the crucibles came poisons as mysterious and potent that death came to the victims either suddenly or lingeringly, as was desired by her no discoloration, often little suffering. The Marquis de Brinvilliers introduced to the making of poisonous compounds by the terrible Exili, the Italian murderer, while imprisoned in the Bastille. The Chevalier Guadin de Saint-Croix, on the release, taught the Marquis of Brinvilliers 
his lover, and nature compounds of poisons. Poisons that would kill, leaving little trace of their nature, yet entailing such suffering on the part of the victims that the hardest-hearted could hardly bear the sight. This extraordinary woman, who was known as a patroness of hospitals in Paris, visited the patients donning out sweetmeats and little tarts of delicious dainties in which were varying quantities of poison. With an equanimity that was almost superhuman, nay fiendish, she watched the results on the various victims during her subsequent visits, estimating by their condition the best doses for sudden or lingering death. The number of her victims was never learned. When she became a mistress of the art, after experience in hospitals, she killed her father and two brothers. Belle Gunness The amazing absence of all emotion or pity or regret in Mrs. Gunness seemed to have been the characteristic of her sisters in blood and history. And do women take a particular delight in crime itself, rather in that which they hope to gain as a result of the crime? The woman who deliberately lured to her home in Indiana many men under the pretense that she hoped to become their bride, and after coddling them with lying flatteries and sweet promises, brutally hit them in the head with an axe, must have had some predominating purpose in so doing. With Belle Gunness, the purpose primarily was to get money. But to the psychiatrist there was more. What if not delight in the shredding of blood? What other reason would there have been for slaying those whose death could have meted no commercial gain? Jean Weber, the woman whose name is excreated throughout France, what was the purpose in strangling helpless children? What but the lust of death which psychologists declare exists in the minds of these women, a moral insanity that finds pleasure in the abominable, the ghoulish, the cruel, that surpasses normal ingenuity. Born in Pampoil thirty-five years ago, Jean Weber went to Paris when a, a girl and worked in kitchens. She married and her first child, a little girl, died. There was no suspicion concerning her death, and strangely there was little to indicate murder in any of the cases. She nursed a child, it died in convulsions or strangulations in her arms. Physicians always gave a verdict of death due to natural causes. Sometimes, as a child lay dying, Jean Weber's hand lay on the tiny, fluttering heart. Otherwise, there was no evidence of foul play. Like the vampires of legend, this terrible woman seemed to absorb their little lives, to inhale from their bodies the vital breath. Only when discovered with a dead body in her bed was any tangible evidence of foul play found. This consisted of three handkerchiefs knotted together. The doctors said they were evidence of strangling. Jean Weber always showed an overwhelming fondness for children. She was as ugly as the ogress of fairy lore, with big yellow teeth and big eyes. Jean lived with her sister-in-law, Madame Blanche Weber. On a March the 3rd, 1905, going to her home for a midday report, the mother found her child on the knees of Jean, struggling in convulsions. Jean, for God's sake, see you're suffocating the child, enraptured a strange smile on her face. Jean's hand lay on the breast of the child. Tearing it from Jean's arms, the mother administered restoratives and the child recovered. 
The mother left the house to return to her work at a laundry. When she got home that night, the child was dead. Convulsions, declared the government doctor. No suspicion attached to Jean, and she continued caring for the other children. Nine days later, when the mother came home from work, Suzanne, aged three, lay dead in Jean's bed with a purple face. The doctors ascribed the death to natural causes. A fortnight passed, and Jean seemed to grow especially fond of Germain, a ten-year-old daughter of another sister-in-law. One day the child was found dead, with protruding eyes and purple cheeks. The doctors viewed the body and ascribed it to convulsions. Marcel Weber, Jean's own fair-haired child, died four days later. Her death was due, the doctors said, to meningitis. Jean suffered her loss stoically. One day, a week after the funeral, she said to her sister-in-law, the mother of the dead Germaine, in the absence of the mother, Jean Weber said she would care for Maurice, her sister-in-law's eleven-year-old son. When Mrs. Marie Weber returned, no one was in the house. Terrified, she ran to her room, there, lying on the bed, pallid, senseless, with red marks on his neck, lay Maurice. The distracted mother hurried Maurice to a hospital, where he recovered. She lodged a complaint against Jean, and the examining magistrate came to the conclusion the woman was guilty of the former deaths of the children. At the trial, Henry Robert defended Jean. The declarations of doctors who exhumed the bodies of the children and held autopsies said there was no evidence of strangulation, and Jean was acquitted. Fleeing from Paris, where people refused to disbelieve her guilt, she took up her residence with a Monsieur Bavouet in the country, caring for his two children. One child died. Jean was arrested and, after eight months' imprisonment, released various doctors ascribing the death to typhoid fever. Jean returned to Paris and led a life of a vagabond. She was arrested, made a confession of killing her niece, but later withdrew the statement. She was released and disappeared into the underworld of Paris, and at an obscure hotel she lived with a male companion. There also lived a poor couple named Poirot. They had a little boy of six, Marcel, a lad with a Raphael face and black curls. Jean took a liking to the child, and on May the 8th the boy went to Jean's room, and sometimes later the parents heard a plaintive cry. They found the child dead in Jean's bed, and for the first time the doctors agreed in declaring death due to strangulation. Then the machinery of the law was put in motion. Jane Toppen Unique in the annals of crime, Jane Toppen, seven years ago, confessed to 31 murders. All of them were actuated by an insane impulse, which at times dominated this woman, by which she experienced an inconceivable pleasure merely in taking life. Jane Topham was a nurse of 25 years. In appearance, she was big, rather stocky with a jolly face, twinkling brown eyes and hair streaked with grey. In appearance, a motherly kind of woman, if there ever was one. For years, no one suspected her of crimes, even when doctors dared to voice suspicions concerning peculiar circumstances attending the deaths of patients. People refused to have autopsies and regarded such suspicion with resentment. Jane was arrested at Amherst in New Hampshire in October 1901, accused of having poisoned Mrs. Mary E. Gibbs at Cutomet in Massachusetts in August. 
This led to investigations of other charges, and Jane finally confessed to the other murders. Her first known victim was Israel Dunham of Cambridge, who died on May the 26th, 1895. Jane had nursed him. When Jane Topham was on the witness stand, she declared, I am not insane. Insane persons do not know the difference between right and wrong. I knew when I committed murder that I was doing wrong. Despite their audacious declaration, she was sentenced to incarceration in the Taunton Insane Asylum, where finally the nemesis of fate overtook her and her mind turned. Haggard, emaciated, a mere shadow of the former jolly nurse, she now believes the food given her is poisoned and experiences the horrible pains of poisoning which in the past so delighted her in her victims. Jane Topham avowed her keen pleasure in the sight of a person writhing in pain. She told of an intoxication of joy at the sight of their subsiding breath and in feeling the flickering pulse grow slower and slower. I want to be known as the greatest criminal, she once said. That is my ambition. Absolutely no sense of remorse ever entered her heart, according to her confessions to journalists, and after witnessing the most agonizing deaths, she would go to bed and surrender herself to blissful slumber. The Bender Family More than thirty years ago, the Bender family occupied a small cottage on a, a lonely prairie farm twelve miles west of Parsons in Kansas. There, over two years, the family, it is believed, committed between thirty and fifty murders. This family consisted of John Bender, the father, then about 60 years of age, his wife about 55, John said to have been 25, and Kate aged about 23. They lived in a one-and-a-half-story house, the lower floor of which was divided into two compartments by a partition of cotton sheeting. In the front compartment, cigars and refreshments were served to travellers. The chair before the refreshment table was located next to the cotton partition, so that a guest's form was visible in the adjoining chamber. Kate Bender was young, rather stout, and fairly good-looking. She was keen and talked entertainingly. She pretended to be a spiritualist medium. When guests arrived, they were greeted cordially by the young woman who entertained them while a meal was prepared. To lure men to the isolated farm, Kate advertised to local papers as a professor able to cure diseases and also as a young woman looking for a husband. Scores are believed to have sought the bride and to have died from the blow of an axe. The benders never used poison. The axe was swifter and more certain. The plan of murder was this. Kate, in her gayest mood, would engage a customer in conversation, sitting vis-à-vis -vis while the guest leaned his chair against a cotton walling. Kate would talk swiftly, never losing the man's interest, when suddenly there would be a crash from the other side of the curtain, and the man would fall senseless to the floor. Hurriedly, a trap door was opened under the table and the victim lowered into a cellar, with Kate assisting in the deed. There, the man's throat was usually hacked to make the terrible work complete. In 1871, the Benders began their artful work of killing. In those days, the country was overrun with outlaws and greasers, and when travellers disappeared, their death were attributed to outlaws. Suspicion attached to the Benders only in 1873 when Dr. William York 
of Independence, Kansas, disappeared. He was traced to the Bender home, where he was last seen talking to the family. After the accusations, the Benders fled, and the man's body, together with scores of others, was found buried in their yard. What became of Kate Bender, no one knows. All lacked pity. Why do women evince so little revulsion at killing? Locusta, who practised poisoning about 64 AD, was no more lacking in pity than Kate Bender centuries later. Locusta, according to Tacticus, was such a proficient poisoner that she was long reckoned as acting as the instruments of government. She was executed in the reign of Galba. Catherine de Medici, to maintain her power during her regency, resorted to the most despicable means of corrupting her sons. Through, though her Charles the Ninth, in his minority, was led into the most frightful dissipations, the mother, viewing with satisfaction the weakening of his mental powers and the increasing depravity which made her rule more secure. Because of her intriguing, she decimated France with wars, and it was she who suggested and urgently insisted upon the massacre of St. Bartholomew, the most awful killing of its kind in all history. Individual crimes have been charged directly to her hands. Perhaps no woman ever showed more heartless depravity in killing those nearest to her than the Marquise de Brinvilliers during the time of Louis the Fourteenth. She was considered one of the beauties of France. Her lover was de Saint Croix, who was imprisoned by the order of her father, Monsieur de Dru Aubray, civil lieutenant, a religious and righteous man. Upon Saint Croix's release from prison, in which he had met the rattan evil exili, master of poison, the two plotted de Aubrey's death. Madame de Brinvilliers, after first testing the poisons on hospital patients, herself administering it to her husband, and with a faithful daughter's look of solicitude on her face, watched his last agonies. She then had her freedom, but the fortune passed to the two brothers, and it was not long, however, before they died, suffering from the same terrible symptoms that marked the death of their father. In 1895, Marie Jomot, a woman of high social standing in Antwerp, convicted of poisoning by morphine a brother and two sisters. Her motive was to collect insurance on their lives. Convicted of killing eight persons, among them her daughter, son and a nephew, Mrs. Sarah Robinson of Somerville, Massachusetts, was sentenced in 1887 to life imprisonment. Two years ago, the country mourned when it read of the killing of children by their mother, Mrs. Clarence Markham, living near Andover. Seized by an uncontrollable impulse, she split their heads and then hacked her own throat. Last September, Mrs. Bertha Mund of Buffalo strangled her three children. Physicians declared she was insane. From the evidence given in the paper, their conclusion in 1908 was that women were potentially more bloodthirsty than men, based on history and brought into sharp relief with the spate of horrible killings by women at the time. We leave you, the listener, to decide whether their conclusion holds true in today's world. That concludes this episode of Wicked Wednesdays. 
bloodthirsty women, we very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we will be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our little channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful, where we look at crimes in a location, such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun, with a unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.